these two elements, activism, life integration, instead is an approach that creates more synergies between all areas that define life, your work, your home, your family, community, your personal well-being, and, and your health. Today, we are going to discuss some stories and tools that make some connections to help us form bridges to coalition. We have a really big opportunity this year in CCL, and we're going to need all of our collective knowledge, wisdom, and support to get carbon pricing to be the law of the land. And are you sharing um, screen or your slides now, Sabrina? I am sharing it now. Awesome. Thanks. So let's go to slide two and talk a little bit about the outline of today's worship. We will start off with a brief introduction of today's topic. And before each of our panelists tells their stories of activism, life integration, we will then go into a Q&A session where the entire group before heading into breakouts and in the breakouts, we'll be able to, um, to have a, a deeper discussion around uh, each one of the topics that you'll choose to go to. And I hope everyone was able to download the latest version of Zoom, which will allow you to select which room you will go into um, for the breakouts. But don't worry if you if you haven't, we've got a method to just place you in the room that you want to do. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. After the breakouts, we'll have a brief sharing of key nuggets from each of the breakout sessions. So this is a large group. And as you've been doing all day with the, the, the other sessions, uh, please use the Q&A chat function to log your questions into the panel for um, and for the debrief. OK, so um, let's do a little bit of a poll. Would you like to launch the poll, Callum? Uh, just a reminder, there are going to be three questions on the poll. One is about your age range, uh, what you'd like to learn from today's workshop, and the biggest barriers to achieve the balance or integration you are seeking. Um, so you're just going to have to scroll down. And we're going to have two minutes for the poll. Okay, we'll just give it another uh, couple of seconds to get the poll completed. We've got a pretty good representation so far. So another uh, couple of seconds, we'll, uh, we'll shut that down and get back into our slides. So if you could just try to wrap up your polls. Okay. Awesome, thank you. So if you wanna take a look at the results, um, we've got uh, a broad distribution of ranges across the, uh, the age spectrum, a little bit of a, a CCL bias towards uh, those that are more experienced and looking for strategies to move forward it's awesome connections and the balance versus integration uh, conversations looks like a topic of interest and some of the biggest barriers is competing with priorities other priorities school work and friends and of course feeling overwhelmed so we'll talk a little bit about each of those as we go through thanks for uh, sharing a little bit about yourself in this let's hit on the uh, next slide. Oops, back one, please. So we want you to be able to understand what barriers you have to navigate in achieving your goals. We have some key concepts for you to consider as you think about this today. Jobs versus hobbies is a really interesting one. And I'll tell you a little story. Like when I tell my brother about all my volunteer work, he says to me, he says, no, you should get a hobby. 
And I say, well, is, is the hobby something that brings you joy and energy, provides social connections and maybe improve something about yourself? And my response is people have plenty of hobbies. Some people play golf, other people try to build coalitions for a, living, a livable world. And that is what I consider my, my hobby. And I get all those things out of it. So integrate versus balance. Balance infers some, kinds of, some kind of competition, but integration is more about being a part of who you are. And I would definitely say CCL is, is part of who I am um, in regards to um, how I approach it. And what does it mean to be a leader in, in context of um, this, this activism? And sometimes it's providing a safe place for other people to grow. Sometimes it's following. Sometimes it could be coaching others. And uh, so we'll let you, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what it means to be a leader in the, in the context of this. And what are some strategies from self-care when, when things get overwhelming? We're gonna hear some stories from the panelists on that. And finally, what might be some strategies that you'll take away from today to, to help you move forward? So we're a science-based organization and we're gonna talk a little bit about science to take care of ourselves to start with. So I've integrated my life to include each of each of the strategies in this slide. For example, now that I work from home, I, I simulate my commute uh, to work. Prior to the pandemic, I would commute to work on a subway and walking was a big part of my morning and evening. Uh, and even during lunch, if it was nice out, I'd walk around Old City. And so the commute was also this mental transition between work and, and off work. And, and now I simulate a commute every day, even though I, I work in my own house and I have a 30 minute walk in the morning and evening and I bookend my day around uh, around that so that I have a clean break between my day job and my other uh, activities. So eating healthy has just been part of my routine for a, a really long time and actually working at home has kind of helped that as well. Um, my social support comes from work, comes from Citizens Climate Lobby, family and friends and you know CCL is a social system and I consider it an integral part of my social net. And stress reduction for me um, in many ways comes from the energy the, uh, from the activities like Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, knowing what we know about the effects of climate change can really stress me out, uh, but CCL is this great outlet for, uh, for this, and it does indeed help me to, to manage my stress. So I'm gonna do a really brief introduction to our workshop team. We're not gonna go into a deep uh, discussion on this slide. I'm just going to introduce them and then we'll allow each of them to introduce themselves in a little bit more detail uh, on, on the next uh, topic. So Jillian Rosendahl is a PhD research biologist at the Naval Research Laboratory. Nicholas Polamenti is an undergraduate computer science student at Georgia Tech. And Nicole Hammond is a graduate student in oceanography and coastal science at Louisiana State University. Stephanie Sharrow is an undergraduate student in physics and sustainability at Stockton University. And then Sophia Giuliani could not be with us today as she is busy vaccinating people. So kudos and thank you to Sophie for that. She is a uh, climate action advocate for the Green Muslims where uh, her work draws from her passion for environmental education and outreach. And we are actually going to start with um, a video from Sophie. And while, while um, Sabrina gets that keyed up, I'll just talk a little bit. Life activism integration is important for everyone, but particularly for a lot of young people. And I, I can only imagine how overwhelming it must feel at times to know that in the midst of earning degrees and finding career pathways and forming your social circle and support group and Figuring out who you are and what you can do in life is you got this climate crisis that will eventually affect everything in your life. So first of all, thank you all for taking on this challenge to, uh, to integrate climate activism with the rest of your life. And um, uh, so, um, yeah, can we uh, can we tee up Sophia? Sabrina? Hey, Sabrina, I've got Sophia's video. Yeah, that would be great if you could share, Callum. I'm okay. having Thanks, Callum. Hi, I'm Sophia Galani, and I am the Climate Action Advocate for Green Muslims. Green Muslims is a volunteer-driven nonprofit based in the Washington, D.C. area. I'm personally based in Northern Virginia, and I would just like to say thank you to the organizers for allowing me to pre-record this message for you all. 
to enjoy while you are doing the life activism integration workshop. I will dive right into the questions. The first one being um, a little bit more about my background. Um, I find joy in nature, um, whether that's hiking, biking, kayaking, um, or even on my commute to work, seeing a really beautiful sunrise or a bald eagle, or being able to watch the leaves change color. Um, the little things uh, just make me happy. Um, more about my family. My I am a second generation immigrant. My dad's from Pakistan and my mom is from Nicaragua. Um, they're both very supportive of my activism work, as is my entire extended family. Um, I'm one of the older cousins on one side, and so I can lecture my younger cousins as much as I want, and they listen, and I hope they learn. Um, and in my friend group as well, I'm kind of like the wealth of activism information for what's going on, not just uh, climate movement stuff, but also kind of social justice information, immigration as well. Um, and presently, I work at a health department, which is why I can't make it today. I will be working at a vac COVID vaccination clinic. Um, school, I graduated from George Mason with a BS in environmental science, December 2019, and have not looked back since. Um, next question is sharing a time I felt overwhelmed would be my senior year at George Mason. I worked two part-time jobs, um, anywhere from 40 to 60 hours, a full-time student, working with green Muslims, working with on-campus organizations, and I combated feeling overwhelmed by prioritizing what I wanted to do and then delegating what I couldn't do or rescheduling what I couldn't do. And so kind of just reevaluating what's going on will help you or helps me with being overwhelmed. Uh, third question is barriers to empowerment. And I am a young female of color and I have felt imposter syndrome and I have been not taken seriously or talked over. And what I have learned is to be confident that I know what I'm talking about. I deserve a spot at the table. Um, and that if I have something to say, I should be listened to and I don't need to be spoken over or ignored or not taken seriously. Um, and being confident kind of takes time. It's hard work. It, it's not linear. You'll read out yourself again but you just have to keep on moving forward and um making sure that that does not remain a barrier to your empowerment um fourth question favorite ways to move nourish connect and be moving i love biking kayaking and hiking um but also yoga um and sometimes i don't like moving at all sometimes i just like staying in bed um nourishing i love broccoli and strawberries um favorite fruit and veggie i can have broccoli with my lunch and have strawberry for a snack and that's a very content day for me um favorite way to connect is undistracted uh when i'm talking to my friends either in person or over facetime a lot now i'm not being distracted when i talk to them there's nothing going on in the background i'm not scrolling through any social media and then my favorite way to be is being appreciative. Um, I've thankfully not been super impacted by COVID. And so I think being appreciative and being humble go hand in hand. Um, fifth question, thoughts on life, activism, balance to integration is a saying I heard at work recently that if you're doing your best, that's good enough. Um, so while you're working to have that life activism balance, if you're doing your best, that's good enough. Don't worry about somebody else and what they're doing, how they're doing it, what you want to do. You're doing your best and that's good enough. Um, and it'll get easier the more you do it. Last question is skills that have helped me in finding life activism balance is following your passion. Um, I'm really passionate about the climate movement and also immigration. Um, and there's lots of social justice 
uh, issues that I'm also passionate about, but maybe not in my top three. And so prioritizing what I'm really passionate about um, helps me keep that balance, not feel overwhelmed and not feeling stretched out with uh, too many projects going on. Um, and that is what I have to say. Thank you all so much for the time. If you want to reach out or connect or work together, my email is Sophia with an F at greenmuslims.org. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of this workshop. Hi, I'm Sophia. Wow, that was really, really inspiring. So uh, again, uh, thanks Sophia for, for that. And so now what I'm gonna do is just kind of launch a couple of questions and we're gonna start out with allowing each, each of the, um, the panelists to, to get the answer. A couple of questions as we go around and then we'll, we'll put out a couple and, and let them all kind of um, feed off each other. So the first couple of questions is around sharing some of your background, uh, talk about what maybe what brings you joy, um, you know, your family, friends, community, what kind of support or tension you're, you're getting from your network. Um, and, and maybe talk about a time when you felt um, overwhelmed and, and talk about, you know, how you resolve that. So I'll put it out to the panel who wants to uh, who wants to lead off and, and uh, do a discussion and then we'll just uh, let you guys kind of go around. I can start us off. Um, yeah, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so I, good afternoon, I'm Nicole Hammond. Um, I'm currently a master's student at Louisiana State University, but I'm originally from the wonderful state of Maryland. Um, I'm studying oceanography and coastal science. Um, so a lot of my master's work, I'm in the field, I'm doing lab work, but I also do a lot of science communication um, with local, um, stakeholders. Um, so I find a lot of joy in nature and other green spaces, especially anything related to the water as an oceanographer. Um, and I've always been really interested in engaged in environmental issues when I was young, but I didn't necessarily know that it was going to be a career I would pursue. Um, I come from a family that isn't necessarily interested in environmental issues, but they are supportive. Um, and when it comes to environmental activism, there's sometimes a disconnect there. Um, but along with my um, family, I have this amazing support system of friends, um, also friends that I've made through activism experience, so through CCL. Um, and currently I serve as a co-state coordinator for Louisiana. So my, a lot of my experiences um, early on in my activism career is actually what led me to what I'm doing now. Cool. Wow. Thanks, Nicole. Who wants to go next? I can go next. All right. Thanks, oh, Nick. Jillian. Okay. Sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Nick. I'm a first year computer science student at Georgia Tech. Um, I first joined CCL as a high school junior in Freehold, New Jersey. So I'm originally from the Mid Atlantic region. And I'm actually still here. I never went to Georgia Tech because of COVID. Uh, I mean, I, I am a student there, but it is all virtual. Uh, though, even with the, uh, the virtual barrier, I am a co-leader for Georgia Tech's new CCL chapter. Um, and I found that it's really rewarding to combine activism and worker life. And it's made me feel really more empowered and passionate to really take action because uh, unfortunately, I would say that while students are empowered to do things on maybe their own campuses or their own high schools, uh, they even face pushback there. And doing anything outside of that is usually uh, very difficult. And a lot of people sometimes uh, just, you know, they don't recognize that even though we might have less experience, we still should have a part at the table, especially something like climate, which uh, will impact us more than anyone else. In terms of what I like to, what I take joy in, I really do take joy in uh, taking part in something good and something bigger than myself. So CCL is a great way to do that. And to share an overwhelming time that I had uh, when I was in high school. So I joined CCL as a high school junior. And right after that, I had to start applying to college, which uh, for any of you 
who don't know, that has become an incredibly compl complicated process, especially with all the financial aid documents and there's just so much to it. So I was very overwhelmed. And around that time is actually when I went uh, to DC for the first time to lobby with CCL. So it was really just everything at once. And uh, I was, you know, very concerned and doubtful about college applications. And at the same time, even feeling doubtful that as a high school student, like what was I going to do to talk to these people in government who have so much more experience than me? Um, but I, I really felt like that I was able to, to learn to combine these conflicting priorities into sort of like one thing instead of siloing them into their own different goals. So CCL became more of steps to my future and long-term goals. And I'd love to talk about that more in my breakout room about life uh, and life activism integration. Um, but I don't want to take up too much time going into the the details right now. So thank you all for coming, by the way. Thanks, Nick. That was awesome. All right. Jillian, I think you were going to go next. Yeah, I, I can jump in now. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jillian. First, I want to thank the organizers for giving me opportunity to share my thoughts here today and for all of you that have taken time out of your day to attend this workshop. Um, I'm a scientist. I finished my PhD about two years ago, and I'm currently a postdoc at the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, DC where I study how fungi adapt to space, flight, and radiation. Um, about two years into my PhD, I realized that I didn't want to spend my life doing research. I felt lost, unsure of what I wanted to do with my future and what I would find meaning in doing. Um, and to be honest, to be really honest, uh, graduate school was a very dark time in my life. I developed severe anxiety and imposter syndrome. Um, however, it was also about that time that I began volunteering with the Los Angeles chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. I really dove right into activism. I began speaking to student audiences at various universities. I went to Washington DC and I lobbied for the first time, which was an incredibly empowering experience. And I took the role of tabling coordinator for the Los Angeles chapter, uh, where I managed organized and managed participation in over 35 outreach events. And during this time, I learned that the things that I find meaningful, such as working towards a prosperous future, that's what brings me joy. And since then, CCL has been somewhat of a bridge to where I am in my current research career and where I would like my career to go. And what I mean by that is that the most trans valuable transferable skills that I've obtained over the years have been from CCL, including developing myself as a leader, which is something I had never seen myself as before. I currently help lead the DC chapter and I have co-led the CCL Environmental Voter Project collaboration for the East Coast. We hosted over 25 phone banking events and I led training for hundreds of volunteers for outreach during the presidential and Georgia runoff elections. Um, I'm currently in the process of, of applying for science policy fellowships and hope to make the career transition into science policy very soon. Cool. And Stephanie. Hi, um, everyone can hear me? Yep. Um, thank you everyone for coming like everyone else. Um, but I um, study physics and sustainability, um, which in itself can be really overwhelming sometimes because the homework assignments just are insane. Um, and what's kind of a struggle that goes along with it is not everyone quite understands what sustainability is. Um, they think it's environmental science, um, but really it's a very interdisciplinary study where I study policy and economics and science all together and I really have to understand it all. Um, and so I brought a lot of that and I started to get into activism. Um, I got into activism in high school. Um, as a freshman, I started to just try and understand as much material as I could with social issues and climate change and everything. And then my senior year, my teacher um, came to me and was like, hey, I wanna get solar uh, panels for the school uh, New Jersey has a grant program, uh, but you need to get 10 points to do it. Um, so I held the Earth Day presentation for the middle school in my district to get that. And that was like my launching pad into college to get into activism. Um, and the way that I really integrated that into my life was that I found a job on campus to do activism. I worked in the Bonner Foundation for two years where I was able to lead a bunch of activism campaigns on campus, but I had to 
do a lot of other people's work rather than what I wanted to do. Uh, so I lacked the passion in some of the fields that they were asking me to uh, volunteer for, uh, all while having so much on my plate between school and work and just life in general. So that's kind of my time at which I was super overwhelmed. Um, I was dealing with insane imposter syndrome between classes and what they were asking me to do. And the best thing that I figured out to help me in that situation was my priorities. Um, so I refocused everything. I, instead of doing what they were asking me to do, I quit that job and I really started focusing on my environmental activism, which really quite brings me joy. Um, working with younger students and teaching them different science uh, ideas is what excites me. I did it all morning this morning um, with a bunch of sixth graders and it was awesome. And it just, it gets me excited every time I get a chance to do it. So I think that was kind of That was, uh, that was great. Thank you all for that. And that, you know, um, Stephanie's, with, <laughs> she gave kind of a great example of this integration piece where she expressed the joy she had with the students this morning. And so. Um, the next kind of set of questions I'm going to ask the panel is to share share some of your thoughts on you know your life uh, activism integration and maybe what skills um, have helped you most in in finding this integration or this ability to be able to integrate in in um, I, you know I hesitate to say balance because it really is this integration so yeah so uh, who wants to kind of give some thoughts on you know on the, on that integration and the skills that you're using to do that. So uh, I, I help lead Georgia Tech's chapter and we have a lot of technical students at Georgia Tech, hence the name, um, and specifically a lot of computer science majors. And uh, not many people who you know, are going to college for things related to the environment. Um, so we've really tried to sort of integrate their academic and career beginnings uh, into activism by taking on more technical projects. Uh, so one of our first projects was using data analytics to uh, analyze social media messages and see which were most effective in communicating climate to conservatives. And it, the details aren't really necessary. Um, and you know, we've, it's still a work in progress. But uh, I think the, the message there is that there are so many uh, connections that can be made with any field or anything that you care about uh, especially with such a big issue like climate, and to to take you know computer science, which is something that many students at Georgia Tech are passionate about, and find a way to apply it to uh, the environment, which is another thing, uh, was just a really great way to do that. And then the second very brief point I want to mention is with everything being being online, CCL has been a really great community. Um, I actually got a message from somebody in our chapter at Georgia Tech asking if I wanted to go out to lunch because they had just moved to campus and didn't know anyone. Unfortunately, I wasn't on campus, but I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of like benefits that you don't even consider when getting involved with activism that will spill over into your life. And recognizing those is really important uh, to kind of like helping make it seem less overwhelming, like all these different competing things. So bringing social, aspects to your life from CCL uh, and career aspects and even just learning in general. Wow, that's a great answer. Any other any other thoughts on um, from the panelists on, on kind of that integration piece and the skills? Yeah, mine kind of ties into what Nick was saying. Um, I found that when you're trying to balance developing your career with activism, it's very easy to run out of time to take care of yourself. Um, and I think that self-care is especially important because we're working on such a heavy and emotionally taxing issue. I feel constantly overwhelmed with the burden of solving climate change. And I'm continually reminded that if we don't solve this problem, the children that I hope to have won't have a livable world. And I think about all the people that will lose their homes and their lives. And it brings me to a very dark place. And it makes me feel like I don't have time to take a break because there's just so much to do. Um, and what I love the most about CCL is that I think this organization has done such a wonderful job at bringing positivity, support, and community to such a difficult issue. 
Um, and I think that harnessing that sense of community and working as a team have been critical skills that have helped me find integration. Um, and as a PhD student, you're trained to do things very independently. So this is definitely kind of something that I wasn't used to before. Um, and this has helped me for a few reasons. First, I, you know, when you're working as a team, you don't burn out, but more importantly, you're not carrying the burden of climate change by yourself. Um, instead, you have an entire community of activist friends that are working with you. Love that. Yeah, so great, great answers as well. So Nicole or, or Stephanie, anything you want to add to, uh, to this question? Or do you want to? Well, I was going to add a little bit yep. to Jillian. So she mentioned self-care mm -hmm. uh, and one of the breakouts, which will be the one I'll be leading is we'll be talking about self-care and reflection. Um, so as someone who's currently in grad school, and I'm sure as many people who are currently in undergrad, um, it is a stressful time when you're developing your career and like trying to decide what you want to do, but also like ramping up your resume and it's just a whole bunch of craziness. I remember and currently know what that's like. Um, and I think it's really important to like take time for yourself. So focusing on self-care, but also self-reflection um, so reflecting on like, what am I going to prioritize or um, I guess kind of allowing, like almost setting a schedule for yourself. So really excellent way to do that is journaling, which we'll practice in the breakout session if people want to join. Um, so that's a little plug. <laughs> <laughs> um, something I just want to say real quick is, um, Starting freshman year in college, I was definitely working on the balance between activism and my life. And now I've really figured out how to integrate the two. Um, and starting off, I really focused on scheduling and prioritizing and like Tuesday, I did this from two to three and this from four to six type scheduling, very blocked out. Um, and I slowly started to change my way of thinking into more of like I'm double dipping projects or I'm giving myself credit for the smaller things because at the end of the day it's like um, if I'm writing a research paper for one of my projects and I'm educating myself about a social issue then in a way I'm learning and I can take that information and share it with other people and that in itself can be a very simple act of activism um, or I would volunteer with one group on Saturday uh, and I could take those skills and it could be a major resume uh, addition. And that was a really great way that I figured out how to integrate it. And it became much less of, uh, I have to study school and do this other thing and much more of I'm studying school and this is helping me study school or I'm doing this and schools helping me do this. And it's really now I can't do one without doing the other. Um, and it really helped relieve a lot of stress. Um, Cause like I was talking about imposter syndrome and Julian was talking about it a little bit. Um, I just felt, and like the pressure of everything with climate change, it was a great way for me to like sit back and go like, I'm doing it almost all the time, but I'm also just living my life. So like, it was a great, great way. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Thanks for sharing. I'm just going to throw a reminder out to uh, the rest of the audience that we will go into open up Q&A uh, to, um, to the audience here in about a, to a minute or two. So if you would uh, get your questions into the Ask Me moderator on the Q, uh, uh, on the, um, the chat channel, that'll help facilitate that and, and just kind of wrap up this, this component, you know, really around talking about ways uh, what are your favorite ways that you that you nourish yourself, uh, that you um, you know connect with others? Any any other thoughts on that before we turn it over to the uh, the audience? Uh, I've been trying to do some more reading. I used to read a lot, uh, especially when I guess when I had more time and I sort of uh, got everything sort of was conflicting with it. But now I've I've tried to take. Uh, time to set aside for reading because I feel like it really has helped rebuild my focus a little bit, uh, especially with like the pandemic, everyone, everything is online and I feel like it's just so hard to focus on anything. And with reading, um, it's really great because you sort of go into this world with literally no responsibility. So it's, it's a very um, relaxing, like you can just enjoy yourself rather than worrying about anything else. And it's completely its own thing. Awesome. Thank you. Any other any other 
comments from the panel before we open it up to the audience for Q&A? Um, with COVID and all and us being so far away, all of my friends live two hours away from me. Uh, so even if we could like try and see each other in a park, we really can't at this point. Uh, so one of my favorite things I do with them is we'll all like hop on Discord and we'll all cook together. Um, because I used to have all my friends over to my dorm room and we'll cook dinner and we did try to do that every now and then, but we can't do that. So we kind of do it a little makeshift way, but um, I have always struggled with like setting time aside for myself to do like the basic necessities. And that was one of the best ways my friends actually helped me. Cause I like cooking, um, but I just never did it for myself cause I didn't see it as like a necessity, I guess, I don't know. And so they started requesting me to cook for them. And that was like a great way to get me to refocus my priorities. And now it's been really cool to see how it's transferred into like an online environment. That's awesome. Cool. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you all the panels for that. And uh, let's go and uh, see where we're at with questions from the audience. So uh, Deanna, do you have a, a question you want to tee us up with? Great. Yes, we already have a few questions. Um, thank you to all of the panelists for sharing your experiences so far. People are really curious to hear more. Um, as a reminder, everyone can send a chat to ask me Q&A to submit your questions, but um, we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, to start, there's uh, one about imposter syndrome. Someone's asking, what is imposter syndrome? And a few of you have brought it up as a barrier to uh, activism life integration. So could you share a little bit about what imposter syndrome means to you and maybe some strategies that have helped you deal with it? Um, so from what I think imposter syndrome is, it's like feeling like you don't belong in the space almost, or feeling like you're a fraud at what you're doing. So like, um, I'm going to explain it in terms of physics, because that's where I first felt it. Um, when I first took my physics quiz, I looked at the question, like my very first physics quiz, I looked at the question and I went, I do not belong here. I will not succeed in this field whatsoever. Um, and I was terrified. I walked up to that professor, handed him a blank quiz and said, I will be dropping out. Don't worry, I'll be changing my major. Um, and he sat me down real quick and went, no, no, just take it. You'll get through it. Um, so it's like this intense anxiety, I guess. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like a strong force, like sitting at a desk taking quiz type thing. It could be a very like slow lurking type anxiety too. Um, but it's pretty overwhelming. Um, something that I found that helped me the most was giving credit to the smallest things and really working to stop comparing um, because we're all living our own lives and we're all dealing with our own things and you absolutely deserve to take up the space that you are taking up. Uh, you are important, what you're doing is important. Um, if you are sitting back and taking a breath, then that's important because that's okay to be doing. Um, and you really gotta give yourself credit for doing those small, small things. Um, because sometimes you just existing and going, hey, I need a breath, is in itself a large, large action. You know, like we always say like science is very powerful. So like stop measuring necessarily everything you need to do, not comparing everything. Yeah, I think adding to that, Stephanie had an excellent like definition and like ways to deal with it. Um, as it's as someone, well, I've personally struggled a lot with imposter syndrome as someone who's like first generation college student, um, but also typically doesn't see individuals who look like me in academic spaces or other spaces sometimes as well. Um, I struggled a lot with it, and I think the key thing is finding like your community and your mentors or allies who are going to support you. Um, so like, for example, one of my best uh, mentors is actually an advisor I had from undergrad. Um, and I did like my thesis with her and everything. And sometimes I'll just text her and I'll be like, I feel like I'm not enough in this program. Am I gonna, like, am I worthy to be here? And she affirms me that you are worthy and there's a reason you are in that program and you will do well. So I think like having that community is so important and those connections. 
sorry, I'm starting to tear up a little bit, but <laughs> it's very key. Yeah, I think it's a very real thing. And so many people around you, I love talking about it because it just makes me realize that I'm not alone in feeling that way. Um, for me in graduate school, it was this immense fear that I was basically an imposter. I had fooled everyone to getting to where I am and they were gonna, and if I made a mistake, even the smallest mistake, people would realize that I was not supposed to be there and that I needed to get out of there, of that space. Um, and it is just, it is terrifying to feel like that all the time. And I don't know if I, I'm loving hearing, you know, the other panelists give examples of how they're overcoming it because I feel like it's still something that I really struggle with. Um, and I just try my best to not think about it and try to think about the accomplishments that I've had and, um, you know, keep going. And I, I hope one day it goes away completely. But I think just, you know, knowing that so many people feel that way. And, and I think, you know, a way that you could help other people is like, just always recognize when someone does something, makes any contribution, you know, regardless of how big or little it is, just recognize that and say, thank you. And, you know, you are really making valid contributions because, um, you know, maybe that person is like, has these um, insecurities that you're not aware of and you could help them overcome that. Wow, great answers. Thank you so much. Any other points on that? Or are we gonna go and grab another question? Okay, Dana, what else do we have? Okay, here's another one that I think a lot of us will be able to relate to. So one person says, reading about the devastating effects of climate change can paralyze me and hinder my activism. How do you calm yourself down? And I would add to that, do you try to calm yourself down or are there other ways that you try to move through those emotions? Any of the panelists want to take a shot? You want to, looks like you're thinking about it, Jillian, go ahead. Yeah, I could jump in. Um, personally, I run every day and that's the only way that I'm able to kind of process all this. I feel like I just think exercise is so important. Um, there's something to be said about processing really deep and dark thoughts, but when your brain is being flooded with endorphins, it makes you see things in a much more positive way. And so for me, like that's kind of the way I'm able to, to, to process it and keep going. Um, and also just the sense of community. I think just being part of CCL, people are so positive. And so that, that definitely helps a lot as well. Um, yes, I was, I was actually thinking about answering to you at the beginning and then I got distracted by uh, Sabrina's comment. I think I want to hear that story one day about how you blew up your equipment. But um, for me, I guess uh, I'm just a very optimistic person. So I, I like to think about it like we have, we've created so many amazing things. I mean, just look at like even your cell phone, something you use every day and like how much human ingenuity that took. And if we can't solve a problem that we created, like I think that we can, I'm very confident that, you know, we, we can solve this considering that not only did we make it, but everything else that we've done and how important it will be to us and it is to us. So I think that uh, especially being around younger people all the time, I think it is a little bit easier because almost every young person I know uh, cares about climate change or at least thinks that it's a pressing issue. Um, and so, yeah, I think even with people who don't, I've, I've gotten a sentiment that like, actually my my brother told me this he's like I you know what I don't even care about the science I just think the risk is too big if it's true then you know we got to do something and I think people recognize that uh and that you know action hopefully it's happening and it will be happening so I'm I'm just very optimistic I I think uh there's enough will to make it happen especially thanks to people in CCL and other organizations very cool I'm going to just share a quick one on that because I'm, um, you know, I, I, I had the same kind of issue as everyone else about knowing what's happening and we're not moving fast enough. But one of the things that just brings me energy is lobby meetings, believe it or not. Well, you think that, you know, from the rhetoric that comes out of Congress and you, you think there's really not a path. And then you talk to these really smart staffers who get it and ask great questions and they're working it behind the scenes. Um, 
anyway, I, I always come out of there with more energy because I know what's being said publicly isn't necessarily what they're working on in the background and things can change quickly in Washington. So, okay. Cool. What else do we have, Diana? So I think we only have time for one or two more questions. Um, and there's so many great ones. So um, there's one that is specific to work, but I think applies to a lot of different settings, including school or um, other spaces. So it says, I work for a nonprofit and people often talk about bringing their whole self to work. I struggle with wanting to do that because I like to keep boundaries of work separate from my personal life. What do you think about that notion? So as we're talking about integration, what are the appropriate boundaries too? I don't know how, uh, how ex my experience is perfect to answer this because I've never had like a full-time job uh, to be fair. But uh, my sort of view on it is you shouldn't let work bleed into your life. But if you want your life to make your work better, then I would go for it. So like, if if what's important to you in life and the things that you just learn on your own or something like that are going to contribute to your work, that's really great. I mean, you're using time to basically kill two birds with one stone, um, but you should never get to a point where like work is taking away from your personal time that you need to just like get up and go to work every day. Um, so it's like one going into the other is okay, but may try to not let it get too overwhelming where you know work goes into your life and takes over that any other thoughts on that i, I i'll share just one real brief but as far as bringing my whole self to work and um i am now in a nonprofit, but i spent a lot of time in corporate and um you know we created um employee groups that allow us to express our love of the environment in, uh, in sharing it. We had gardens at work, uh, vegetable gardens to feed the community, and um, we reduced waste in the work site. And so the employees were encouraged to bring that aspect of their life um, into the workplace, and, and we were given a space to, to exercise that and work. And so that, to me, was bringing part of myself at work that I you know, maybe wouldn't have if, if the company wasn't as open to allow that and it created a whole new network at work because it was a big company and I met all these other people that had similar interests that I didn't work with on my day-to-day -day job but we connected via this other um, network of bringing yourself to work and there's other networks too around you know the um, you know just you know women in the workplace and veterans and Asians and um, African Americans and so we all had this way to bring our whole self to work and, and express ourselves and multicultural. So I think that might be part of what at least this corporation did. So I think um, you want to try to grab one more question, Diana, before we. Yes. And this is a great one to end on. So young voices are very important and it would be great to get some ideas from all of these young panelists on how we can support them. So Nicole mentioned positive affirmation, but is there anything else you can think of that um, would help all of us to support young voices working on climate? That's an excellent question. Um, I think, um, I think like giving a, a space for everyone's voice to be heard. Um, it's like, for example, I mean, it's been a while since I was 18. I'm in my twenties now, but <laughs> Um, like I remember like sometimes when you're young and maybe you're within a group of mostly adults who are like 30 or above, um, there's sometimes that uncomfortable situation or you feel like you can't have your voice heard. Um, and I think having that platform and like that space for voices to be heard. Um, and so I personally really love like mentorship um, and more mentoring people. So there's currently a, a young high school student who's interning with the local CCL chapter I'm a part of in Louisiana. And like, she's amazing. She's like leading events, creating them. And I think like having like open discussions and conversations can be really helpful. Um, I don't know if that answered the question, but. <laughs> um, yeah, that, oh, sorry, you can go ahead, Stephanie. Okay, thank you, Jillian. Um, I think it's really, really important not to like, underestimate uh, young people. Like I, hel I held an event today, um, this morning with six through K 
um, and we did a bunch of science experiments and every single one of my coworkers was like, they're not going to understand it. They don't know what they're talking about. Like they're not going to, we were talking about volume. That's it. Um, I knew those students were going to be able to get it. And the fact that like almost all of my coworkers were like, no, 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 that's too hard of a concept. Like give young people some rain and just believe in them a little bit. Um, because like Nicole, the person you were just talking about leading entire events and stuff. Um, I was 17 and I gave the Earth Day assembly. Um, I walked up to my principal and I was like, hey, you want to look at my PowerPoint? And he went, nope, good luck. And I was like, okay. And I, I haven't really experienced that level of confidence in me um, by like coworkers and like mentors since. Um, and it's really draining to like not only be dealing with like pressures of climate change, imposter syndrome, schoolwork, family and all that, but then to show up to like these organizations and be like, hey, I'm really passionate. I really wanna do this. And then to go like, but are you sure you know? Um, it can be really exhausting. So just a little bit of like confidence in us is great. Awesome. All right. Thank you for that. I think we're going to pivot now into the next segment of this workshop. And this is where we went to breakout rooms. And if you could um, share that slide, uh, that would be great. Yeah. So we have a number of uh, breakout rooms that we're going to allow folks to um, self organize into. And thanks, everyone. Welcome back to the main room. And uh, thanks, everyone, for their participation in in the breakout rooms, we're just going to do a really quick debrief uh, from each of the rooms. And um, I guess I'll start uh, room one. We had jobs versus hobbies or jobbies, as I call them. And um, uh, there there was some um, some consensus around, you know, um, volunteer or activism work can be um, a, uh, I call it like energy uh, giver versus an energy taker. It can, it can be both. And, you know, CCL is a, certainly a, an example of where I personally get energy. And, and, and sometimes it can, others said it can, you know, it can take energy because it's a lot of work to get this stuff to happen too. So it, it is a, a given, a, a, a given and take in, in terms of that, but there's other ones that are, um, you know, I would say, you know, active in terms of physical activity, whether you're cleaning streams or building gardens and things like that. And so, yeah, there's a lot of volunteerism or activism that and turn, turn out being um, just like a hobby or, you know, a, a jobby, if you, if you will. It's, it seems like work, but it's not really work because of what you get out of it. Um, sometimes we integrate it by spending time during the day, um, during the work day, uh, <laughs> stealing a little a little time from work to, to get some uh, activism in, but then we, we kind of blur that line, you know, so our, our work goes into the, you know, evenings and weekends too. Um, yeah, sometimes it's not as fun, but it feels better. So it gives you, again, it, it, it's, it's some energy and it's, it's a little different. So um, mm -hmm. anybody else from the group one want to add anything? And we're going to, if, if folks want to um, talk during this, this session, I think we still have um, the ability to unmute. Is that correct team? It'd be great if they did, and they can just raise your hand, and, uh, and you can and you can chime in as we as we go through. So, if folks want to raise their hand and add anything uh, additional for Team One, um, go ahead and do that, or else we'll just pivot over to um, one of the other breakouts. What do we got for uh, integration? Nicholas, you had that room. Any any of anybody from integration want to share a couple of key nuggets? Yeah, I'll share a few quick and then maybe uh, others will share. So um, we found that actually the, the best like spillover benefit in our life from CCL was fulfillment. And that was said the same across all demographics, which I think, um, you know, is pretty, it seems pretty obvious, but I guess it's something that, you know, we sort of expect because why are we activists if not for fulfillment, but really taking time to appreciate that and think back on it. Um, and think about that feeling really makes you feel more engaged and empowered in activism. And especially for people just starting their careers, uh, you know, things like social networks are good for everyone. And then uh, also for students, um, definitely getting more experience and learning. Um, 
And then we started talking more a little bit about priorities and blocking off time, which I think was another breakout room. And that just goes to show how all of this is integrated. Um, and so we were talking about how uh, it's really easy to keep yourself from doing something because you feel like it needs to go a certain way. And so, uh, you know, sort of have a different mindset to it where it's not like you need to do something, especially when it comes to activism, but rather you want to. So instead of making an obligation, make it, um, you know, next time I am free, I'm going to do this uh, and make it something you, that you feel empowered to do rather than obligated. If anyone else wants to share, uh, feel free. Thanks, Nicholas. That's great, great, great discussion. Um, let's pivot over to uh, leadership. Um, yeah, so we talked a lot about how leadership can be used to overcome barriers in activism. And a, a lot of what I was hearing was um, folks having trouble with delegating tasks. It, it, sometimes it's a lot easier to try to do everything yourself because you know how it can be done. And, and sometimes it's hard to trust others to, to do the tasks that you know you need done. Um, and how that is, you know, that ends up being a barrier in itself because you really need to trust others to build capacity. Um, and we talked a little bit more too about what the most effective leadership characteristics were. And a lot, you know, we, you know, people said listen, being a good listener, really being able to hear what your group um, wants to do, um, but also really like building the relationship with your team. Like it, it's much easier to trust someone to do a task if you know them. And it's also to, easier to get them to do the task if you, if you know what drives them, right? And so um, relationship building is also super important. Um, and I know there is other things, but I'm, does anyone else want to add from my group to some other ideas that we talked about? Okay. Thank you, Jillian. That's awesome. All right. And Nicole, self-care, do you want to give a couple of highlights? Sure. Uh, we had a really good discussion about like the definition of self-care and self-reflection or self-reflection and self-care but then also like concepts and kind of tools to do both of them um so we talked about using positive affirmation um journaling and then we talked a little bit about like what are in what we do personally for self-care um so like physical nourishment getting outside um is there anything else that from my group that would like to share um, a really good discussion. I think someone said uh, using like a fitness app to help keep track of like their eating and um, diet and stuff. I think, I think they said that's helped them a lot. Cool. Thanks, Benjamin. Also, I may have just, uh, I might have missed seen, but I think Justice raised their hand. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I did, but it's fine, basically. Um, no, the main thing I was going to say is just the, like, I feel like in society, um, like, we talk a lot about, like, how talking to yourself, like, oh, if you talk to yourself, you're crazy. But I noticed, like, a popular thing in the group was that people actually talk to themselves or write a journal towards themselves, just to friendly themselves. So, you know, talking to yourself might not actually be crazy. It might actually be what you need to, you know, really just understand yourself and your own mind, you know? Cool. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a good, good tip. All right, do we have any other hands up? Or we want to go to the last group? Not the last group, the next group. Priorities and goals. Hi. Um, okay. So we started with a little self-reflection about um, what motivates us and what our end goal is. Um, and then basically everyone kind of had the same end goal of we want, you know, to clean up the world and do better. And um, But everyone had a little bit different on what motivates us. Um, then we talked a little bit more about how to go deeper and how to set like priorities. Um, and how to find out what's really important to us and why. And then we talked uh, briefly about SMART goals and um, some skills for setting goals um, and to give ourselves frameworks so they're more attainable. Um, I sent that link 
into the chat if everyone wants to see it. Um, and if you can't open it, just shoot me a message or uh, your email and I can send it to you. Did I miss anything from my group that anyone would like to say? Cool. If anyone, uh, if anyone has any anything to add before we kind of wrap it up here, just uh, please raise your hand and uh, we'll let you go next. If there's no other comments, I'll close it out. Uh, well, yeah, I just had a you know, brief comment. Yeah, I, yeah, I just thought ahead. it was um, so kind of going, adding to what Stephanie was saying, I thought, I thought it was uh, very useful to have you know, you know, specific goals and actionable goals. Uh, you know, and she had the idea of having, you know, let's say three things to accomplish in, in a day. And I think that's very useful. So you, you can kind of build momentum and you have things that are doable, but also, um, you know, move you forward towards the goal rather than kind of having, you know, this, your, your mind kind of focus on, you know, so many things you could do and not, you know, achieving uh, a lot of them and then kind of getting down on yourself for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that, Sidir. Yeah, I also had a comment too. Uh, yeah, please, go ahead. Oh, so yeah, like it's something that I kind of helped me when I was like helping or working against my anxiety and stuff like that is to make big giant goals that can overwhelm you into smaller, more attainable ones. And I think that smart uh, technique that Stephanie introduced is definitely helpful because it makes these small goals that you can complete like week by week if you really want to, or even day by day. Um, what I used to use was like Google calendars or just sort of any kind of app like that can give like these little tasks that you can check off every single day. That's like, oh, today I studied, you know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes or probably more than that, but, uh, or like today I, I don't know, actually ate a meal, stuff like that. Just, I think that really helps. Um, and also just, I had a comment about the self-care. Um, Someone mentioned that you have like fitness apps and stuff. I think it was Nick who said that if you treat things more like less of an obligation and more of something I want to do, and if I missed it, you know, it's not the end of the world. Uh, that definitely helps me like a mindset for when I do fitness goals. Um, like, oh, I didn't go to the gym today or I didn't run my mile today. I can still do it tomorrow or I can still do it now if I wanted to. Like just every step, you know, is progressing towards it. Cool. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a great insight. Appreciate it. And I uh, thank everyone for your participation in uh, all the breakout rooms. And I want to thank our panelists, uh, Jillian, Nicholas, Nicole, Stephanie, and Sophia. And I also want to call out a thank you to the support team who have um, really been awesome in making this thing come, come off. So, you know, Callum, Crystal, Diana, Karen, Karen, Olivia, and uh, especially Sabrina for helping uh, make this all work. So thank you, everyone. I hope everyone got something uh, beneficial and took some tools that they can take back. And I hope you made some connections as well. And um, yeah, thanks everyone. And uh, enjoy the rest of the, uh, the, con the conference. Thanks everyone.